So now we've really come to the crux of the matter. We've spent a while introducing Satan and spending some diligent time deducing who it must be. We've sent, spent some time determining that the wandering multitude, in, including Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar, are in the wilderness and seeing the spiritual backdrop that that puts upon the discussion. So having introduced those two elements, this is the, the crux of the matter. The fact that the Satan meets the righteous man in the wilderness and necessarily they must fight together. They can't do anything but, given their naturally opposing natures. And I think that's why the core of the book, all the way from chapter 4 <clears throat> through to the end of chapter 31, Job's final second speech, is, uh, is centered around the interaction of those two opposing creatures. Those are the chapter numbers laid out there. So let's look at, uh, and that's, what, that's the material we have to get through this morning, because you can understand we'll be moving at some pace. In fact, it's worth saying it's rather difficult to present uh, ideas from the debate because you kind of have two choices, neither of which are very good. One is to give some sort of glib overview where you just say, well, you know, the friends got it wrong and Job also made some mistakes and leave it at that, which doesn't tell us anything of, of interest in detail. Or you can try and sort of go clause by clause and verse by verse and, and that takes about a month and, and you've forgotten where you started by the time you get to the end. So we're going to try and do, uh, approach this in a, in a sort of a bite-sized pieces that are going to be detailed enough to be meaningful, um, but brief enough to be able to keep our focus. We notice that there are in fact eight, or seem to be eight speeches, that is each of the three speakers uh, speaks three times with the exception of Zophar, the third occasion. I'd also like to make a further uh, exception. If you look at Bildad's third speech, that's chapter 25, I think you could easily see he was cut off. He never got to finish. It's a tiny, tiny few sentences before Job just cuts in. Um, in fact, statistically speaking, it's a, it's a speech which is less than 15% the length of the average speech. So I think we'll say that's not really a speech. Job cut him off before he got going. And uh, so we'll, we'll maybe just uh, drop that one and say we actually have seven complete sets of finished speeches and replies from Job to analyze and see the way that this, uh, this combat develops. Why did Job uh, interrupt when he did, you might say, if he really did interrupt Bildad on that third occasion? He'd been so patient for so long. Why was it that when Bildad spoke that third time that it was all finally too much? There's at least uh, three good reasons. The simplest reason might be that at that point we really had literally started uh, repeating ground. Here's, from, here's a quote from the very first speech. This is Eliphaz speaking. He says, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more, more pure than his maker? To which Job, responding at the end of that first round of speeches, acknowledges Eliphaz's comment uh, as helpful. Indeed, I know that this is true. How can a mortal be righteous before God? By the time you get to Bildad's third or attempted speech, possibly months later, he brings up the point, how then can a man be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? And so you can understand why Job might be thinking, um, I think we've been here. You know, we've pretty much come full circle and we haven't gone anywhere forward. So that's the point at which Job says, you know, enough. So one of the reasons I think Job interrupts is simply because Bildad is repeating ground that's already been covered. I think there's another couple of possibly even better reasons why Job cuts in when he does, but that at least is a, is a simple uh, reason to start with. Running throughout all of the speeches of the friends, and we've met this before in our opening talk, is the doctrine of retribution. The idea that's, that's probably most uh, best represented in the New Testament, John chapter 9, that one could look at a man born with a, a physical affliction and say, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's the most present form of that doctrine. And what I want to show you, I think we've all accepted that it's there, just spend just a couple of minutes showing you that in all seven completed speeches, the doctrine of retribution is clearly to the fore. So I'm just going to take one little sentence from each of those seven speeches and just show you where it is so that you can be confident of the matter yourself. Eliphaz gives three complete speeches, chapters 4, 15, and 22. And these are quotes that show that uh, he believes in the doctrine of retribution. Let me explain again what that doctrine means. It's the idea that in each individual life, and in a short time period, 
Every act of good is rewarded with a blessing, and every act of evil is, is uh, punished with a curse. Okay? It's very simplistic, and it's quite uh, untrue, at least in that uh, frame. So Eliphaz says in chapter 4, Who, being innocent, has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? Well, stop and think about that question. Have you ever heard anything so stupid? I mean, I don't want to, to be you know, unnecessarily mean to poor Eliphaz, but who, being innocent, has ever perished? Open your Bible at a random page, and the answer will be in front of you. Right? In his second speech, he says, For the company of the godless will be barren. He says, Godless men will never prosper. Again, false. And fire will consume the tents of those who love bribes. A dangerous comment, given fire has consumed uh, part of Job's wealth. And then he finally, he makes the false accusation, Job, you sent widows away empty-handed, and then finishes with the doctrine of retribution. That is why snares are all around you now. That is why sudden peril has come to terrify you. It's because of explicit sin you committed recently, that's why you're being punished. So those are the three speeches of Eliphaz, clearly the doctrine of retribution in all three. In the two speeches that Bildad completes, that's chapters 8 and 18 respectively, again you'll see them right there. Job, when your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. And many people, many readers of the book of Job, including brothers and sisters, do assume, possibly from this verse, that Job's children were actually sinful and, and the feast that they were having was some sort of state of debauchery. I thoroughly reject that thesis. Don't be, don't be put off. Don't start believing. It's a funny thing to say. Don't believe everything you read in the Bible. All right? <laughs> At least pay attention to who's speaking. And again, Bildad says, the lamp of the wicked is snuffed out. The flame of his fire stops burning. And likewise, Zophar, in the two speeches that he completes, um, if you put away the sin that is in your hand, Job, and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, you will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only as water's gone by. So he's quite explicit. If you immediately stop sinning, you must be sinning now, Job, because look what's happened to you. Then immediately everything will be restored. God will owe you. Notice that's what's present there. If you stop sinning, God will owe you a good life. So you must get a good life back because you wouldn't deserve the punishment anymore. There's very many errors in that. In fact, when he says the wicked man's food will turn sour in his stomach, it will become the venom of serpents. Think about, again, of the implied time scale. He's saying if you're a wicked man, why, you know, if you do something evil, within the time span of the digestion of a meal, some punishment will come upon you. Okay, it's a little bit of hyperbole, but you can see he's, he's imagining that these things are repaid in the terms of hours. So these are the mistakes made uh, implicit in the doctrine of, of retribution. First of all, the doctrine of retribution says, well, wherever you see affliction, it must be God's punishment. Now, it is true that God occasionally brings affliction as punishment. We see examples in the Bible. Sodom and Gomorrah, for example, had uh, displeased God greatly, and they were punished because of it. So we're not tying God's hands here and saying that he cannot punish people with affliction where he sees sin, because he can and he does, Ananias and Sapphira being a very, uh, very specific case. But the point is, just because God does occasionally bring punishment and affliction uh, as punishment doesn't mean that all affliction is that way, and that's the mistake that the doctrine of retribution makes. The other important mistake is the fact that retribution is actually true. There will be an accounting, but it's on God's time scale. We might want to see a sinner punished within hours of committing the sin, but that's not the way it works. God is a God of grace and a God of love, and he spends all of our lives reaching out and appealing to the sinner to abandon the sins themselves. He's not interested in punishment per se. In fact, we know that retribution cannot be paid within the lifetime of an individual. Why? Because else what purpose would Judgment Day serve? Right? If everything is fully paid for or accounted for or... You know, there would be no need for a judgment day at the, end of, at the end of the matter. Why then do, oh, I want to, to offer some sympathy here to the three friends, although I don't agree with their standpoint, why are the three friends so convinced that when they look at Job, um, they think they're seeing a man being punished for sin? I wonder why. We could say, ah, oh, it's because they're so stupid and, and laugh. That would make us into the three friends. That would make us as sneering and as condemnatory as they are. So let's not go there. What is it that has made them so convinced 
that in meeting Job, they're meeting a man under God's punishment. If it is true that they are in the wilderness wandering, as I, con uh, I clearly conceive that they are, then they are with Moses, amongst others. And towards the end of the wilderness wandering, as again I conceive that they are, Moses gives a series of exhortations, a series of, of speeches, of prophecies. And one particular one is in Deuteronomy 28. And turn that one up in front of you, because we're not going to have time to read through it. I'll put up as much as I can on the screen, but it's quite a lengthy chapter. And it's a very symmetric chapter. It starts out by saying, I don't know if it's verse 1, but you'll, 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 you'll find it. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you. Which verse is that? Because yeah, That is one is the start of it. And then somewhere later in the chapter you will find an exactly symmetric expression saying, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands I give you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Which verse is that? 15. 15. Okay, so you've got those two halves. And what you should notice, sorry, I should have noted those verses, then I wouldn't have to ask. You, sh you should notice that the, the, the blessings and the curses, the blessings must be sort of verses 1 through 14, and the curses 15 onwards, are absolutely symmetric. And so you can actually print out the chapter like this quite accurately with just the green and the red showing the blessings and the cursings. And let us be specific about what it is that will be blessed and what it is that will be cursed. I've put them in bullet points there. You will be blessed or cursed in the city and blessed or cursed in the country. So in city and country. The fruit of your womb, that's your children, will be blessed or cursed. And the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed or cursed. I don't know if anyone here is expert enough to spot a cursed kneading trough when they see one. It sounds a little tricky, but uh, we'll, we'll have a little think about that. And finally, you will be blessed or cursed when you come in and blessed cursed when you go out. So those are the specifics. And this comes from Moses. Who is Moses to the multitude? Moses is amazing. Moses is powerful. Moses is the friend of God. He is the man who went up the mountain that no one else could touch lest they die and came down alive. He's the man whose face was known to shine so much that he terrified us in the multitude. And we didn't want to look at him and he had to put on a veil before we would even approach him. This is a man with ultimate authority and credibility and he has delivered this powerful speech. So can you see if this is ringing in the ears of Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar, can you see why they would look at Job and say, I think we know what's going on here. Let's, let's lay out the comparison nice and explicitly. So in Deuteronomy 28, Moses' prophecy, if you sin, says Moses, Moses himself, you will be cursed in city and country, in children and flocks, in basket and kneading trough, something to do with your food supply, and in going out and coming in. And then they look at Job. And what do they see? Job's flocks have been destroyed in the country. Job's children have been killed in, in the urban areas. Job has wasted away to skin and bone. He has said of himself, I am escaped only with the skin of my teeth. He has something to do with his disease. means he cannot digest food for nutritious purposes. And Job himself complains. When I go out to the marketplace... I am ridiculed, and when I come home, my maidservants count me as a stranger, and my breath is offensive to my wife. I am cursed in going out, and I am cursed in coming in. So the three friends look at Job, and they think, let's see, cursed in city, check, cursed in country, check, cursed in children, check, cursed in flocks and herds, check, cursed in food supply, check, cursed in going out, check, cursed in coming in, check. Ah! Now I know what's happening, and I have the authority of Moses himself, in which I have my confidence. Was it not Eliphaz who says, Job, those even older than your father are on our side. I believe he was referencing Moses, I can't prove that. But clearly he had great confidence that some old wise man had essentially backed up his case. To their, you know, to their mitigation, the three friends saw Deuteronomy 28 
fulfilled before their very eyes, not in some sort of general way, but in all seven explicit points. So we can perhaps begin to not agree with them, they are wrong, but perhaps we can begin to have some forgiveness for the error that they have made. Because if I'd just heard Deuteronomy 28 and run into Job, I could see myself making the same mistake. So why then is Deuteronomy 28 not the doctrine of retribution? Or, to say it the other way around, why is Job not definitely one who is cursed by God uh, as a sinner? What error did they make in the interpretation? And I think this is key. And I think this is why God brought this affliction on Job, because he knew that every Israelite heart would make this mistake. The prophecy was given on the scale of a nation, not on the scale of one man. And on the scale of a nation, this doctrine of retribution has generally been true. Just read the book of Judges. If you sin and abandon me as a nation, I will send the oppressor to invade you until you cry for help and turn back to me. And if you cry for help and turn back to me, I will raise up a deliverer and you will again have a time of peace. You will see that cycle enacted seven times over 230 years throughout the book of Judges following on uh, after Moses' prophecy. And this again was spoken to a nation. What you cannot do is look at one specific individual's life, one man or one woman, and apply this global thinking to their circumstances. God will work with individuals according to whatever plan he has to work with them. And there's a second uh, problem as well. Of course, as we've said before, retribution happens in God's timescale both for the individual and for the nation. So don't think you know enough to see the answers in one man's life when you're listening to the prophecy that's given to a whole nation. I think that's why God has brought... I think it's, God does so many things at once. The moment Moses spoke God's true words of prophecy, he thought, well, I know how they're going to take this, and I've got to teach them that's not right, that you can't look at any one man and say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, because he was born blind. So immediately... Job's life comes coincident or shortly after Deuteronomy 28, just before they're going to go into the promised land, in order to educate the, uh, the multitude. God is always working to illuminate us and to educate us uh, that uh, they've made an error. So what then should they have concluded when they saw Job? Really, there are two possibilities. We learn from Ecclesiastes, and this is contrary to uh, most uh, Christian thinking, this is contrary, that, that statistical forces can be allowed to operate in the world. Okay? The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. And I know it's comforting to say, I know that every single thing happens in, that happens in my life has meaning, and God is working with me, and it definitely has meaning. But these, these verses challenge that. How then do we resolve that? Are we truly just cast away into the winds of time and chance to be buffeted by a God who's not connected to us? I'd like to think no. But then, if some things that happen are, are statistical, how then do we have to let go of the idea that everything in our life that happens has meaning? Here's my answer. I think that everything that happened in Jesus' life had meaning, every good thing and every bad thing, because he was in perfect resonance with the Father. And if you completely abandon God, not to the point of, of knowing about God and sinning deliberately, but you know, essentially to grow up in a jungle knowing nothing but the trees around you, then your life is completely given over to statistics. We are somewhere in the middle. And this is a wonderful encouragement for discipleship. What it suggests, if that is true, is the more godly we become, the more we commit our lives to God, our life won't necessarily get any easier and it won't necessarily get any more difficult but there will be more, more of the things that happen in our life will have meaning. And we'll only get all the way up to 100% if and when we perfectly become Jesus Christ. So we won't be, be hit that completely at all. So that's a great encouragement to me to, be, to commit more of my life to God. Because the amount that I commit to God, will then God will use and everything good and bad will have meaning. But the amounts I, of my life I keep for myself and say, no, I just want to do what I want to do then I'm abandoning myself to the winds of time and chance. It's my choice. Free will reigns. That's a, a rather complex philosophy, and we probably want to talk about that at some point. Let's just move, move through that. So they could have concluded that. 
Or, is, in other words, either God was active in Job's life or he wasn't. Right? That has to be the answer. Either he was or he wasn't. If he wasn't, then there's no reason to say it's God's punishment. If he was, then the actions will reveal God's character. And God's character is that he is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Or as Jesus himself explained, no, this affliction happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. So even though these are New Testament quotes, of course, which the wandering multitude didn't have written down, the character of God was the same. They should have concluded, if this is the work of God, which it pretty obviously was, because it was so supernaturally unlikely, then God is manifesting his character somewhere here. Why then do I jump to the conclusion that what I'm seeing is condemnatory punishment? Is that the God that I believe in? Because if so, if I find myself in a boat on stormy waters, I might say, my God needs a sacrifice, you better throw me in. It's that same attitude again, isn't it? In the three friends as that Jonah got confused with. So that's maybe the line of thinking they should have taken. Okay, let's, let's get to the, the meat of the matter. Let's look then at each of these speeches and each of Job's replies and see what we can learn from the progression of this wrestling match between the Satan and the righteous man. And before we do that, I just want to change the display of that graph. I'm not going to shuffle anything or change the order. A lot of expositors say, oh, I like this bit to belong to this speaker over there and just basically plays, plays their own jigsaw puzzle. I'm not going to do that. I don't think there's any justification for playing like that. I'm just going to change it like that. They're all in exactly the same order. You can see the chapter numbers. I've just changed the line breaks. So I'm going to say, let's look at these two speeches as one set, and then the next two speeches as one set, and the final three speeches as one set. Why? Because I think that's where the character of the speeches changes. I'm going to suggest to you and show you the evidence that on this first level, those first two speeches, Eliphaz and Bildad confine themselves to making observations. And they make very few errors because they're just making observations. They say, you're wearing a white stripy shirt. Things like that. It's an observation. You're unlikely to make a mistake in that, uh, in that case. But by the time Zophar speaks for the first time and Eliphaz speaks for the second time, We've got to the level of interpretive argument. Okay, we've got to the level of saying you're wearing a white stripy shirt and you're doing that deliberately to annoy me. Right? It's an interpretive argument. Oh, it turns out I was correct on this occasion, but, <laughs> but either way. Okay? And so we'll see, and you'll notice that in that statement, the key word is because. So you'll notice the word because in chapter 11, and you'll notice the word because in chapter 15. That's a little link word you can look out for to tell you someone's giving you an interpretive argument, not just making an observation, but saying, I see this, and I know why. It's here because this reason. And finally, when we get to the last three speeches, where Bildad speaks for the second time, and Zophar for the second time, and Eliphaz for the third time, we get to the level of outright condemnation. Okay? You are wearing a white shirt, you're doing it to annoy me, and therefore God will judge you and you will die. Okay? That is the condemnation level. So that's what I'm going to suggest to you, and then we're going to have a little look, a little wander through the scriptures and see whether this is true or false. And I'm not suggesting that there's these sort of crystal clear watershed between one level divide and another. It does sort of slide gradually downhill. But I'll provide some evidence for that being true. And this might also explain a better reason why Job, Job breaks off the discussion when he does. Because by the time we finish this final level, all three speakers have independently condemned him. And so when the next guy starts to speak again, it's like, why are we going any further? All three of you have written me off before God. There's nothing left to say. You've condemned me. You're either right or wrong, but you've condemned me. It's over. And I think that's really a good reason why Job cuts, cuts Bildad off. Okay. Level one. So we're looking at Eliphaz's first speech and Bildad's. That's chapters four and eight, respectively, and Job's replies to them. Now, interestingly... When these two speakers are confining themselves to um, observations, and you might want to scurry through the scriptures and have a look at the verses in front of you. I won't have time to, uh, or space to put them all up on the Bible, this, uh, all up on the screen this time, so please uh, follow through if you want to. They actually end up saying good things. Isn't that interesting? When they confine themselves to just observing Job, they have nothing bad to say. So Eliphaz actually praises Job's good works. He makes the mistake of the doctrine of retribution because he says, because you've done good works, God will owe you a good life. 
so you're bound to be vindicated. Now, that's not actually true, so there's a little mistake there. But he still does notice that, that Job does good things. He will come to explicitly contradict those words later, but for now, he's fine. And Bildad also speaks of Job's innocence. I don't think Bildad declares Job innocent directly. I think he has some sort of implied statement that suggests that he's innocent. Does anyone have those verses in front of them? That's right. Surely God does not reject a blameless man or strengthen the hands of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter. Okay? So it's not a direct statement of Job, you're a good man, but the implication is that he is. So Eliphaz starts with a direct statement, Job, you're a good man. And Bildad has already kind of diluted and downgraded that, but it's still positive. He's implying Job is a good man. Okay? So what's Job's response to that? So he responds to Eliphaz here, and he responds to Bildad in this chapter, chapters 9 and 10. And as long as his friends are making only observations, Job remains in his same condition of being humble, yet despairing. You understand why he despairs. He's, he's, he's in terrible pain. The despair is not wrong. He recognizes his own sin in chapter 7, verse 21. He recognizes his own sin in the context of all men's sin in chapter 9, verse 2. And he pleads for God's recognition of his blamelessness. That again shows that maybe the doctrine of retribution has snuck into his mind because he shouldn't need to mention his blamelessness when he pleads for restoration. He can plead for re recovery and plead for restoration whether or not he's innocent or guilty, unless the two are linked. So that's what we have here. His response is humble and despairing. His conclusion is humble and faithful. There it is in chapter 9. I chose that as a kind of a summary of his attitude in those chapters there. How can a mortal be righteous before God? So at this point he's saying, how can I claim that I must have a good life? Because I can't be righteous in the face of God. That's the end of, of level 1 in the fight. So then we move to level 2. We're going to have a look at chapters 11 and 15. That's Zophar and Eliphaz. And we're going to claim here that we have the beginnings of interpretive reasoning. Interpretive reasoning isn't a bad thing to do, but it's obviously potentially where errors creep in. So you've got to know what you're talking about. The key word is reasoning is because. So chapter 11 verse 18 is there and chapter 15 verse 25. Zophar says explicitly, Job's disasters come because of his sins. So it's because you've done these wicked things, that's why you're in trouble. And Eliphaz, who had initially spoken well of Job, it's like the three friends are actually poisoning each other. They're listening to each other. And Eliphaz says, Job, you used to strengthen the widows in chapter 4. But by chapter 15, he's kind of persuaded by Zophar's attack. So he takes a very different tack and says, yeah, you're right. You know, Zophar's, Zophar's got it right, hasn't it? If, you, if you're this beaten up, you must have done something wrong. Why don't you tell us what it is? Why don't you confess? And then you can be okay again. So there's... That's where the interpretations come, the implications of guilt. And notice, therefore, what happens to Job, the righteous man. Job knows that these accusations Zophar is making are false. We've, said, we've seen in, in chapter 31 his, his testimony of, of, of good conduct. So now someone's hit him with a false accusation. He becomes combative. He wants to fight now. You've punched him in the face unfairly, and, and he's, he's ready to fight back. So he declares his own righteousness. See that in, in chapter 12, verse 4, or chapter 16, verse 17. Okay? Job actually declares his righteousness. Now remember, back in chapter 9, he was in the pure state of saying, how can a mortal be righteous before God? But by chapter 12 and chapter 16, he says, yes, but I am righteous. I'm righteous and blameless. Which is partly true, but perhaps not his place to declare. So he's getting to the point where he's beginning to justify himself. He's getting confident in himself because he knows the accusations brought against him are wrong. So his conclusion here, now that I've prepared my case, I know I will be vindicated. Bring it on, he says. I'm, I'm in a good place. And that's interesting because this is a good education for us. False accusations one day will be brought against you. They've been brought against me and it'll happen against you. Maybe they're little things, maybe they're huge things, who knows? Be careful. It's dangerous. It's a dangerous position to be right. You have the confidence of saying, I know I'm innocent. But that confidence can manifest itself 
in dangerous and destructive ways to yourself. This is what is happening to Job. He knows he's innocent, but because he knows he's innocent, he's ready to leap up and bop someone on the nose. Job's conclusion, he wants to fight. Look at these words. Come on, all of you, try again. I will not find a wise man among you. Maybe he won't, but that is an extremely combative attitude to take, and it's beginning to sound like pride, which is ironic, because pride is what the three friends are suffering from. That's what the Satan is, and the Satan is very, very contagious. Let's now go to the third and final level. We're looking at uh, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz in chapters 18, 20, and 22, respectively, and Job's responses. And I've labeled these the condemnations of Job. I say this is the level at which all three just openly condemn Job. Bildad and Zophar do it hypothetically. In other words, we've seen this already. Chapter 18, Bildad says, I've, you know, I'll tell you about the, what happens to a wicked man. And he keeps it hypothetically, a wicked man. And then he describes everything that's happened to Job. And Zophar copies him. Zophar thinks, oh, that was a good trick. Let's do that again. So he re his chapter 20 essentially repeats what, what Bildad did in chapter 18. And Eliphaz, having heard Bildad and Zophar, says, well, we don't need to keep this hypothetical, do we? We mean you. And he goes right for the jugular. And in so doing, he explicitly contradicts not only truth, but also his own testimony of chapter 4. And chapter 4 says, Job, you know how, how well you've treated the poor and the widows. And chapter 22 says, Job, you know how badly you've treated the poor and the widows. And he's absolutely turned himself around. And so Job's response is now angry. He's self-justifying. And this is where it all goes horribly wrong. He now becomes angry with God. Because the friends have, have so convinced him that every wicked man must be punished and every wicked man must suffer, and everyone knows Job is suffering, that Job is now angry with the friends for the false accusation that he's been wicked, and then angry with God for the suffering, since the suffering makes him look like he's wicked. Okay? So you see how that all builds up quite logically, but it's still a, a disaster. So Job actually goes to claim that God has wronged him. Look at chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. That's where... where Job says, God has denied me justice, or God has treated me wrongly. And so he actually replies with condemnation himself. He condemns his three friends for scheming to wrong him at the end of chapter 19 there, and also at the end of chapter 21. So Job's conclusion is that he speaks well, not of God, he speaks well of himself. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice... I will not deny my integrity. Forget God, it's my integrity that needs to be spoken of here. I will maintain my righteousness. Not God's righteousness, my righteousness, and never let go of it. My conscience will never reprove me as long as I live. And that is his conclusion in chapter 27 when the debate is done. So what that I'm sorry for the somewhat breakneck speed through chapters 4 through 27, but I think we've picked up the relevant points and we have the uh, references here to support them. Let's look at the effect on Job of these three levels of debate. As long as there were observations, Job remained humble and despairing because the observations didn't make any errors and actually they spoke to the fact that Job had lived a good life despite the fact that he was blasted by affliction. When the interpretative arguments began to imply Job's guilt, he became combative and he wanted to fight back. And I'm saying this not for the sake just of learning of Job. Learn about yourself. If someone makes observations about your life, so be it. If someone gives you interpretative comments that suggest how, how ugly you are, well then look, you, you tend to sort of jump up and start boxing. And when he's condemned, he is proud and self-justifies. He no longer wants to talk about God. He just wants to talk about himself and how he is not deserving of the situation. So that's what I see happening when Satan meets the righteous man in the wilderness. So the Satan has fought the righteous man in the wilderness, the, the three friends. Now the three friends' arguments failed. They just made false accusations. It wasn't true. So, question, who won the debate? No one is not a bad answer. I quite like that. Did the three friends win the debate? For sure they did not, because their accusations were false and they were not able to, uh, 
they were not able to, to substantiate what they were saying. So did Job win the debate? Not really. I mean, intellectually, he had actually rebutted the argument. So who won? Satan. Remember, you had three proud friends versus one humble man. By the time you get to chapter 27, you've got four extremely proud and angry men throwing chairs at each other. <laughs> right? It's not even a business meeting either. It's just, it's just a, these were friends. Satan has come through as a winner. So when Satan meets a righteous man in the wilderness, Satan wins. And you might think, uh, hang on a minute, has Brother John ever read the New Testament? <laughs> yeah. So what kind of precedent does that set for Matthew chapter 4? When Jesus, the righteous man, meets Satan in the wilderness. Is Satan going to win then? Manifestly not. So what's going on? What? Se second round. It'll come back. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a tag team. Yeah. Try my big brother. Yeah. No. Unlike Job, Jesus keeps God in the picture. and you're totally on the right track there, Peter. That's an excellent point. And, and what I, I think I, what I want to say is when Jesus defeats the Satan, he does not do so because he is a righteous man. Jesus is a righteous man. That's not what defeats the Satan. That element will lose to the Satan. The Satan is stronger than the righteous man. What is the Satan not stronger than? God's word. Because that's what's going to show up in chapter 39, right? We know because we peeked ahead. We know what's coming around the corner. God's word is going to show up and squash the Satan. That's the order of power. The righteous man, stronger is the Satan, stronger is the word of God. Therefore, when Jesus defeats the, temp the Satan in the wilderness, it's not because he's a righteous man. It's because he's the word of God. And the word of God, well, the word of God essentially can only be in the hand of a righteous man. But yes, that's right. But the righteousness alone will not defeat the Satan. And I think, that's, I think that's what Jesus learned when he read the book of Job. My righteousness is not going to defeat the Satan. And when he wrestles with the Satan, he never says a thing. He just quotes the word of God. I think that's deliberate. I think he knows what he's doing now. So let's uh, finish up the subpoena. So, and this is the chapter we read. Because God, uh, Jonah... Uh, God, Jonah, I can't get the right name in a minute. Job, that's the fellow. Because Job is angry at God, he actually subpoenas God. I'm using a modern word. I sign my legal defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Do you see what he's calling God? He's calling God an accuser. And in that he's caught saying that the accusation is false, he's calling God a false accuser. Anyone want to say that in Greek? Yeah, he's calling God the, the devil, right? I, I'm not just doing that consciously, but that is the automatic implication. Because he has fallen victim to the Satan, the Satan has defeated him. He saw the opponents of his three friends with, who had terrible arguments. He defeated them readily. He only defeated the enemy that he saw. But the unseen enemy, who is always the most dangerous because you don't see him, the pride of the friends leapt from them into him, and he never even noticed it happened. So he has not seen that that's what happened. But here he is, strutting around in pride. Surely I would wear God's indictment on my shoulder. I would put it on like a crown, like a prince, I would approach him. Remember that word, prince, because God in his speech is going to introduce the word king. Perhaps the word king, of whom Job currently served as prince. So I suggest to you, God will not answer now. God, it's not true to say God cannot, ever. But if God answers Job now, it will reinforce to Job his false thought that, that the creation can demand audience with the creator. Because be quite clear what Job has said. He's angry now. He says, God, get down here and give an account of yourself. How can you justify doing this to me? You have denied me justice. Come here now. That kid's scarred for life. <laughs> Not only that, he didn't come here either. <laughs> Oops. Timing is everything, eh? But, um, and so God won't come to Job now. Not because he doesn't love Job. Not because he can't. But because if he does, he'll reinforce Job's error in his own mind. 
So, someone else is urgently needed. This is, a, this is of great importance because almost every expositor of the book of Job comes along and gets this strange character Elihu and says, where did he come from? What's that about? As if he's some huge surprise. If we're paying attention to the spiritual thread, he should not be a surprise at all. Clearly, God, if God talks to Job now, Job will re, be reinforced in his error and more shut into his error that he can demand an audience with God. So God isn't going to talk to Job now. Job has stupidly boxed himself into a corner where he cannot hear from God anymore. What then? Should he continue talking with the three friends? Clearly not. They've become so entrenched in their positions, they've built up walls. Their relationship is completely broken down at every level. The three friends can say nothing to Job that Job will listen to. God can say nothing to Job that Job will understand the correct way. So if God truly loves Job, he needs to send someone else. He needs to send an intercessor that can clear the subpoena that Job has issued against God. And suddenly, someone else turns up, as if it were a gift from God. And I think it is. Enter Elihu. Who is Elihu and what is his purpose? And if you read the vast amount of literature on the book of Job, there's different opinions as, as on everything. The preponderance of opinion goes against Elihu. And, and, and most expositors will tell you Elihu is just an, a fourth, fourth friend, really. He's just, or even he's even worse than the others, particularly those who take Elihu as the Satan, of course. But I suggest this is, a false, this is an incorrect thought. Elihu, I suggest to you, is a good man, unlike the three friends. And I will argue in the book ten major differences between Elihu and the three friends, which will allow you to come to that conclusion. I'll show you, we have time for maybe half of them here. Uh, Elihu is completely different from the three friends. Please do not confuse him with them. Here are the criti some critical points about the character of Elihu. I'll put the references there, but I won't put the verses up. Elihu calls for God to be praised. Did you notice the three friends never did that? They spoke about God quite a bit. They said, we understand how God works. We understand why God has done this to you. We understand what God's going to do next. But they never called for him to be praised. Elihu calls for God to be praised. And if it is true that speaking well of God is the central theme of the book of Job, how much more important does that comment become? Elihu says that his wisdom is from God. The three friends say that their wisdom is their own. And they're absolutely right, because their wisdom is folly, and it is their own. But Elihu says, if I speak anything wise, it comes from my maker. I ascribe wisdom to my maker. If I have knowledge, it comes from afar. It doesn't come from me. Elihu's, this is very important, Elihu's desire is that Job be found innocent, is that Job be saved. Same as God's desire, isn't it? God's desire is that we should all be able to be found innocent. That's in chapter 33, verse 32. It's not exactly difficult to point out that's a little bit different from the attitude of the three friends. They not only want Job to be guilty, they're going to help facilitate that and bring the convictions in themselves. Elihu is angry. The three friends are angry. Job is angry. God is angry. This is a very angry scene we're in right now. But Elihu is angry for a different reason than the three friends. Elihu is angry because Job has not justified God, he has justified himself. The three friends were angry because Job wouldn't accept that their false accusations were valid. The three friends were angry because Job wouldn't confess the sins that they were insisting he'd committed. But Elihu is angry for the same reason God will be angry, that God has not been justified, Job has justified himself. And finally, and perhaps most convincingly, Elihu is not rebuked by God. If Elihu is the same as the three friends, why would God punish three out of four? This is not consistent. Elihu is not rebuked by God at all. You might say, well, hang on a minute, Elihu isn't exactly praised by God either. He actually fades, evaporates out of the text as does the morning dew. Why is that? We'll come to a very good reason why that should be in a minute. What then is his purpose? I suggest to you, he needs to clear that subpoena. He needs to prepare Job to be able to hear God's word. At the moment, Job can't hear God's word. Why not? Because he's demanded it. He said, God owes me an account of his behavior. So if God speaks to him, Job will sit in judgment upon God's confession of himself. So Elihu needs to correct Job that that's not really where he should be coming from. And so what he will do specifically, he will persuade Job of the danger of pride. Because Elihu switched on. He's resonant with, with God's will. And so he sees the real enemy here. It's not the three friends per se. It's their pride, which has now gone into Job. 
So you'll notice Elihu speaking about pride. And he's also going to introduce God's speeches. In that sense, I want you to think about Elihu like John the Baptist. Someone who introduces the word of God. It's normal for an important speaker such as Jesus to have someone to introduce him first. Well then if Jesus is worthy of having a man going before to introduce him, how much more is God worthy? Right? If we expect uh, John the Baptist to prepare the way for the word of God in Jesus, then we should expect one, Elihu, to prepare the way for the word of God in arriving in undiluted form. See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. This is something God has said. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come. And Job was seeking the Lord, albeit in angry form, and the Lord will come. And so he will straighten the way. And this is taken from the prophecy of Isaiah that says that. We're running out of time, so let's just skip through this last bit quite quickly. Here's an, I just want to point out one thing about John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. He ends up correctly predicting some of the words Jesus will say. John says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And it says that's what proves that he was the one preparing the way. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Is it correct to say that Jesus is quoting John the Baptist? I'd rather say no, even though this was spoken first. Jo this is the word of God. John the Baptist has correctly anticipated some of the words that will be spoken. And therefore the phrase is the same. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. John the Baptist was very mindful that claiming Abraham as your father was no defense against whether you were good or ill. In that sense, I wonder if he's a type of Elihu, who is going to say to Eliphaz and Zophar and Bildad, look at these guys, they claimed Abraham as their father. They thought they were righteous, but that's not what godliness was about. Here are the two errors Job has made. I cry out to you, O God, but you don't answer. So Elihu straightens him out. No, no, God does listen and respond. Job, why do you complain to him that he answers none of man's words? For God does speak, now one way, now another, though man may not perceive it. The second error, Job justified himself. Job said, I am justified before God. God is guilty before me. As surely as God lives who has denied me justice, I will not deny my integrity. But Elihu says, no, you've got that backwards. I'm angry about this. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. And just in the same way as John the Baptist correctly anticipated some of the words of Jesus who was to follow, why, so does Elihu correctly anticipate some of the words that God will speak when he follows. So it's pretty hard, once you've got that in place, to say that Elihu is an evil man. No, he's not. Listen to this. Stop and consider God's wonders. Do you know how God controls the clouds and make his lightning flash? Can you join him in spreading out the skies, hard as a mirror of cast bronze? And you can see this style of questioning, and actually even the specific content of the question, matches very well what God himself will say to Job. So I think we've seen that Elihu is really beginning. There are other comparisons that I haven't put up there. I've put them in the book. But I think we can see then what Elihu's job was, was to correct the errors Job had made. And notice that the criticisms Elihu makes of Job are only of what's come out of his mouth while he was listening. He doesn't try and condemn Job's whole lifestyle and make up false accusations about him persecuting widows. So, he's, so even though he's critical of Job, as are the three friends, he only criticizes the actual mistakes Job has made, which are purely verbal and within the debate. It's the only criticisms uh, that Elihu makes. And it's also no worth noting, pay attention to the weather, because that is going on in the background. And since it's in the Bible, it's important. A storm is building. Okay? So you can imagine, you, you know the scene, the temperature starts to plummet, and the sky goes dark, and the wind howls. And that's pro probably what prompts Elihu to notice the clouds and the flashing lightning, because it's probably going on in the background. Because a storm is building up, and the final speaker who will prepare the final answer to this debate, and indeed many debates, is preparing his thoughts and preparing his words within the storm. And from out of the storm, in this, in this very stormy scene, not only physically and meteorologically, but emotionally. Remember, everyone's angry. The three friends are angry because they've been insulted. Job's angry because he's been falsely accused. Elihu's angry because Job has justified himself, not God. Everyone is angry. So it's a storm on the ground and a storm in the sky. And out of that storm, God speaks. <laughs>